And uh, hi, thanks to, uh, thanks to Roger, thanks to Sasha, um, thanks to everyone at Typographics for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be here. A lot of heroes on this stage, both old and young. Um, so I'm Rob Jampietro. I'm a uh, creative lead at Google Design in New York, uh, and I help lead the, the material design studio here. Uh, before that, I was a principal at Project Projects, and I'm going to show work from both places today. Um, I've also written a lot about design. Um, I ha that writing is mostly collected at my website, Line and Unlined. And since 2006, uh, I've taught in the RISD MFA graphic design program. So um, as an educator, I'm also really pleased to be up here at Cooper Union. Um, so I've been a designer, a writer, a teacher. Um, and I'm excited to be at Typographics in particular because I love the sort of subtitle of this conference. Uh, it's not just for people who make type, but for people who use type. And I'm really someone who uses type, who thinks with type, um, and who thinks type conceptually is a really interesting and, and, and endlessly fascinating thing. And we've seen a lot of perspectives on that already today. Um, and lately, I've been thinking a lot about type as a technology. We, we host a conference at Google called SPAN, and the tagline is Conversations About Design and Technology. And when I was making this talk, I realized that type really sits at the intersection between these two things perfectly. Um, it's, both t it's both design and technology. And so that's really where I want to start. Um, I snapped this a few weeks ago uh, when I went to see the Fishley and Vice show at the Guggenheim. Um, it's a series of sculptures that they did called Suddenly This Overview, and this one is subtitled Behind Thick Walls, Gutenberg Invents the Printing Press. So I'm sure this is probably exactly what it looked like. Um, but you know, this moment, which Juliette pointed out in her talk, is really profound. Um, here's just one metric of that. In, in November 2013, the Atlantic surveyed 100 eminent historians looking for the greatest technological innovation since the wheel, and the printing press won hands down. And you know, if we think about why this is, I mean, from the moment that typography arrives, it really accelerates information. Um, it quickens writing. It makes, it makes writing faster than handwriting. It broadens access. You know, mo suddenly, more books can be produced. It spreads knowledge so you know, more people can learn from those books. And it creates opportunity. Within a half century of the invention of the printing press, there was a whole industry that had grown up around it. Um, and when you're thinking about acceleration, you know, I think you can look no further than these kinds of examples. You know, how do you accelerate information across the ocean or across the galaxy? Um, and we're still solving a lot of these problems today about how to get information to you quickly under tough conditions. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that you know, graphic systems often develop through solving typographic problems. Um, so when, when type is hard to read uh, while moving at high speeds, we engineer a graphic system of highway signage to deal with that problem, and there's a typeface that accompanies it. So really, if you, you know, want to understand type typographic innovation, uh, you can understand graphic systems better. Um, you know, and, that, and often, typography and typographic innovation is driven, as we've seen today already, by shifts in the materiality of type itself. So from pen to ink, to phototype, to digital type, and so much more. Um, when you think about Bedoni's you know, super thin and modern serifs, they come to us thanks to copper engraving. And Bedoni was really trying to express the fidelity of that material. And again, here in material design, the sort of precise modeling of light and shadow really helps to articulate the planar aspects of these UI elements. So I'm not the first to observe this. Um, Tobias, after a wonderful presentation today, um, wrote in 1999, what is the role of technology in determining the identity of a font? Does, it, does the typeface appear at the beginning or the end of the production cycle? Is the typeface what the designer makes or what the reader sees, and I, I am still thinking about this question. You know, more than, more than a, you know, a few years after I read it, and it's true that type, you know, accelerated writing, but at the same time, it had to be very precisely manufactured. It wasn't fast to produce type, even though it accelerated writing. Um, it, had, it was really tooled with the jeweler's precision, um, and it often was made collaboratively by large teams of people. So knowledge had to be shared across them, and those systems for making type had to be extended and repeatable. And this is really something that, again, we encounter at Google all the time. Our team on material design is, is very large, um, and we have to coordinate uh, the way that we share our specifications across many members of that team, uh, even in situations like this one. So, you know, I think, I think this begins to suggest that, you know, just after type systems appear, um, they become more modular, they, there's need for more control, more specification, 
And there's even a kind of grammar to non-type components, the way that they can behave typographically. So here again, in some of our material design components, they, they kind of fit together the way that words, you know, like t letters form language and words. Universe is an amazing typeface. It's another one of those typefaces that I find as a designer I return to again and again. Um, it looks as contemporary now as it did in 1954, and I, I sometimes wonder to myself, you know, who will design the Universe for VR? I mean, maybe it will just be Universe, but um, as type became more finely honed, uh, there were schematic systems that sort of evolved, like this one, to sort of organi organize and rationalize uh, the formal components that were part of these larger systems. Um, and the same thing is happening here uh, with our system for material colors, uh, trying to help people understand and really um, systematize the way that they use color uh, in code. I talked before about how type's medium creates new expressive potentials each time it changes. Certainly that's true with uh, typesetting, as Riley talked about earlier. Um, you know, there were more ligatures, there was tighter letter spacing, and uh, code really is a new medium for type. And here it allows our identity system to be made of multiple equivalent varying and animated states. And uh, this, is, this is, you know, a very interesting, uh, interesting moment for us. There was sort of critical typography, too, things that, that really broke the norm in a sort of magical and even energizing way. Um, and and uh, this is an identity that we did for the Columbia School of Architecture and Audi at, when I was at Project Projects uh, for a program they did called Experiments in Motion, thinking about new forms of mobility. And here, the title of the initiative uh, is sort of uh, freed up to become a kind of electron cloud of letters that can reorganize themselves uh, in, in different formations. Uh, and those particles become the basis for announcements, um, and they also mix into the background of the website with uh, custom animated GIFs. Um, there's now digital type that can accept parameters. Roger was talking about that before. Uh, and, 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 and accept the parameters from the world as an input, so responding to its environment. Um, and for me, let errors uh, twin and the way that it responds to the weather in the Twin Cities, I'm a Minneapolis native, uh, was a very early and important example of this. Um, and thinking about, that was some of the thinking that informed Project Project's um, identity for iBeam uh, in Brooklyn. You know, we used the letters as an ever-changing set of data visualizations that could be footnoted and were extensible by the iBeam community, um, visualizations that ranged from the technical to the humanistic, uh, from things like alumni count to um, more sort of unexpected things like creative errors. Here's uh, just one of the applications. I talked about materiality earlier, and dimensionality can definitely be a type of material. You know, as type enters the third dimension, it, it becomes more sculptural, and it really helps to establish place. Um, at Project Projects, we explored this for the RISD Museum. Uh, people had heard of RISD before, uh, but we wanted to emphasize the museum, or the building over the RISD, the campus in this place, and give it its own presence. So we extruded this M monograph, and we dimensionalized it and made it spatial. You know, and along the way, you explore lots of different things. At one point, we even proposed uh, that it be built as a set of four gallery walls uh, that could be used for special exhibitions. So this is a CAD drawing showing ADA-compliant wheelchair turning radiuses so that to prove that people could actually move around these walls, which govern the spacing of the strokes. Um, and here's a little bit more of the identity in use. One of my favorite observations about typography comes from my teacher, Paul Elliman. He writes, writing can give the impression of things and conversely, things can give the impression of writing. And that's what's going on here. You know, some chairs making up the word Tone for the company's catalog in 1937. And I think this was sort of in the back of our minds at Project Projects uh, when we took on uh, print magazine's uh, collaboration issue and made this kind of figure of the ring with chairs on the cover. Um, they feel almost human uh, for this issue, uh, but they're kind of imperfect at the same time. As type democratized, it became more durable, more do-it-yourself, something that you could do in the city, and Corbusier recognized that and used that kind of urgency for his plan for Paris. Here's a website we did at Project Projects for the Aggregate Architectural History Cla Collective, a group of architectural historians writing on the web. They wanted to sort of, they were frustrated that they couldn't actually build buildings like architects, and they wanted to build buildings with their writing. And so we developed this grammar of roof lines and dwellings, these kind of components that behaved like letters and were modular, like stencils. So this is sort of building and stenciling. Sometimes the old becomes new again. That's a theme of technology as well. 
Um, and certainly that's the case with typographic revivals, um, kind of finding old forms within a new medium. At Project Projects, we worked on uh, commercial types, uh, newest website design, uh, which featured revivals like this one. This is Austin Hairline, uh, based on the 18th century original. Uh, commercial did this for the Wall Street Journal. And we also worked with Commercial and with Christian Schwartz to revive W.A. Dwiggins' Electra for our identity for the Academy of American Poets. Uh, this is Poets Electra. Um, Electra, of course, is the typeface of the Norton Anthology of uh, arts and American letters, um, but its di existing digital version uh, lacked a text weight that was suitable for the proportions and the durability of the web. And so we based this version, or Christian based this version, on the proportions of Georgia. It's kind of Georgia dressed like Electra. Um, and this is the power of a kind of tight collaboration between identity design and type design. Uh, identity can, this identity can travel far beyond its source because it's made with typography. Um, and and, and you know, this, is, this is another theme of the day or mentioned earlier. Um, we, made the, we made the poems on poets.org embeddable, sort of like YouTube videos, so they could be placed on places like Tumblr, but the spirit and the form of these poems stay intact. And a th thesis of this identity project was that poetry is really the sort of ultimate mobile art form. It's really designed to travel and to be spread. Um, and and that's, that's exactly what we were thinking of here as we extended some of this playfulness, including bright contemporary colors that you wouldn't normally expect from a sort of poetry organization into print. If there's a moment that I sort of realized that I wanted to be a graphic designer, I think it was when I saw this typeface by Matthew Carter for the Walker Art Center. I grew up, again, I, as I said, I grew up in Minneapolis, and um, I, was, I remember being in the Walker gift shop when this came out, and I'd never really thought much about type before, but I certainly didn't realize that it could do things like this. Um, and it was very much, this, this identity was very much in our minds when we were approached at Project Projects by SALT, which was a museum in Istanbul, to create their identity system. And they told us they were interested in something that could vary, uh, the way that perceptions of an institution vary, something that could be used with everyday language uh, and be accessible to a broad public, uh, and something that had an emphasis on exhibiting art rather than collecting it. Uh, and so those were the things that we sort of took into this identity. And we thought, what if, you know, what if the alphabet of the letters A to Z had four letters, S-A-L-T, that sort of formed a set of rooms of a kind of gallery within a larger museum? And what if that gallery had a changing exhibition that rotated every few months? So the, the typeface could sort of become an, a mechanism for exhibiting things. Um, and, and in this way, the public uh, identity could sort of exhibit contemporary typographers and their work, and they would be invited to come to SALT and respond to the institution and, and sort of install these four letters in the alphabet. Uh, and over the last few years, people like Dries Wewaters, uh, Thirst in Chicago, Silky and Min in Korea, Obake, and even students at ACOL have, uh, have taken up this challenge. There's a bit more of the identity in use. And you know, within the identity system, SALT's typeface is used, uh, and then it expires. So there are different campuses of SALT, and they don't have matching signage because they were built at different times. But all of this sort of comes together on the web. Each post has a date stamp that corresponds to the version of the typeface that was used at the time. One of the most interesting things about language is that it's always growing and it's always changing. Uh, and type has the capacity for its own self-extension beyond the 26 characters. Um, it's responsive to the marketplace, uh, to, you know, branding is adding new marks uh, to the f world of letters all the time. Uh, and there are more unusual examples, like this one, uh, the reinvention of the inv individual self, a letter that's, that's made for just one person. And at Project Projects, uh, we had the, uh, the, the uh, opportunity to make a glyph with the artist Jesper Just, something that would sort of hint or tease his video installation for the Danish Pavilion in 2013, for the 2013 uh, Venice Biennale, which was filmed, among other locations, uh, at a smaller replica of the Eiffel Tower in Wangzhou, China. And our campaign, which preceded uh, the exhibition, uh, appeared as a set of posters that sort of conflated stills with this video from, uh, with these glyphs, these mysterious sort of tower-like icons. Uh, and it was, in it was installed and popped up in Copenhagen, Hong Kong, New York, Paris, and Shanghai. Uh, this is a little bit of how that glyph was made. Uh, if you look at the word Eiffel Tower in Chinese, uh, it's spelled phonetically, and here's, uh, here's the beginning of that component, the letter I. 
um, which is actually a kind of grass uh, it, it, as, a word, as a word part, uh, but it also sort of reminded us of the form of the Eiffel Tower, but we thought, you know, what if we flip it and make it look even more like the Eiffel Tower? And at this point, it's no longer readable in any language. Uh, and we sort of loved that it became private at that moment. It became a street code. It was sort of unavailable. It was a hidden replica. Um, emoji are sort of one of the most interesting examples of this type of language extension right now, um, and they make ideographic expression available to all of us to use. Um, emoji brings something new to type design, uh, and with our identity for the SPAN conference, which I mentioned earlier, we let our own material icons flip and tumble a little bit like the intercourses work I showed you before. The icons within this identity uh, could tell stories, they could become much larger than life, larger than they could be on any interface, uh, and they could help to introduce ideas in new ways. So on the subject of introductions, um, why we're here a little bit, uh, earlier this week, uh, we introduced the new Google Fonts directory. Uh, and it was not just my work. Uh, Emily did a wonderful job of saying, all design is a team effort. And um, I want to give a huge thanks to my team. If they're here in the audience, um, please give them a big hand for everything. So I'll spend, I'll spend the last five minutes or so on that project. Um, Google has a long tradition of 20% projects, basically spending one day a week on something other than your main project. Um, and Gmail started this way. Cardboard started this way. So it actually has some, can have some profound effects. And Google Fonts was launched in 2010, and it started this way with David Cattell and his team. And actually, David Cattell is here with us today. Um, before 2010, as you might recall, uh, people were using fonts within images or kind of via hacks like Flash, and it was slowing down the web, which where type is everywhere. Uh, but solutions were sort of limited. You know, ideally, for us, text could just be text again. And this meant finding a way to make web-safe fonts, um, but even then, only, a lot of them were only available in Latin. And so how do you get people using real fonts instead of hacks, and how do you make type on the web easier for people to use. Um, and we thought about this as a kind of Google scale problem, which are the types of problems we love. Um, and we were excited to try to get involved. So we think speeding up the web benefits everyone, and especially uh, users on slow internet connections, like I was describing earlier. And Google Fonts has, as this map shows, some really passionate users in India, in Russia, and in lots of other places. So to these data-constrained users, data is money. You know, they need the web to be lighter and faster so that they can afford to use it. And they need type that's truly global in many, many more scripts than Latin. And that's part of why it's so exciting to me to see all the great work that's being done in non-Latin typography at this conference today. So we launched Google Fonts in 2010, as I mentioned, and it had immediate impact. Within 12 months, um, views were topping a billion, uh, font views were topping a billion a day uh, after the first year, and they're topping nearly 15 billion views a day uh, six, here six years later. Uh, at the end of last week, we passed a really major milestone for our team. We passed 9 trillion font views since Google Fonts started. Uh, and that's a lot of views, uh, and it's going up every day. Um, and it, you, know, you may not know this, but Google Fonts is actually one of Google's most used APIs. So that just gives you a sense of the power of typography. Um, so that's all of our fonts in aggregate, but it gets interesting if you look at individual fonts. So Open Sans uh, has roughly 2 trillion views to date, which, to put it in context, is 1,000 times more views than the most viewed YouTube video, Gangnam Style, um, which, which means basically designers, you too can be bigger than the biggest YouTube stars. Um, and uh, Roboto has over a trillion views, and there are 11 designers in our uh, catalog which are shown on this slide, that have over 100 billion views for their fonts collectively, which is extraordinary. Um, what, we've, what we're also realizing is that while access to typography is important, you know, quality is just as important. Uh, we started with 14 typefaces. We now have over 800. Um, and until now, it's really been kind of a bottoms-up effort at Google. Um, but we, more is not more, and we get that. Uh, so when Material Design, uh, which is my team, began working with the Google Fonts team last spring, we approached quality on two fronts. Um, we wanted better craftsmanship for the fonts on our platform themselves, and we wanted a better experience for browsing and selecting them. And on the latter goal, um, please meet our new Google Fonts directory, which is a design resource for everyone. 
and we, uh, to celebrate, we worked with one of our favorite uh, New York design firms, Athletics, and we made a video. You can clap. Thanks. We appreciate that. So Material Design had already provided access to design components, as well as a systematic use of color and, and iconography. And Fonts really nicely complements that mission. So our teams are working closer together every day. Um, and we all help to power Google's core infrastructure with our work. So on the goal of better craftsmanship, Earlier this week, uh, we launched uh, three new fonts by celebrated type designers and foundries. The first is Scope One, uh, a titling slab serif by Dalton Mag, and I think Bruno's here today somewhere. Um, so, lovely work. Uh, Bungie, which is a typeface drawn from the urban vernacular by David Jonathan Ross, who works with Font Bureau, now Type Network. Way to go. <laughs> and Space Mono, which is a retro future monospace mashup say that three times fast, from Colophon in the UK. Um, and they're a fantastic, uh, they, they made a fantastic new specimen that's in all of your swag bags. And uh, look for that along with a Google Fonts poster from our own Damien Carell uh, in your conference bags a little bit later. Ben Critton from Colophon is here with us as well. Um, so we'll continue to do uh, some of these collaborations about twice a year or so to give type designers an opportunity to do something on our platform that either reflects their own approach or maybe is something they couldn't do anywhere else. Uh, and we're really excited about this initiative. Um, but we want great typography everywhere, not just for Latin. And for the past few years, we've been sponsoring and working with great local type designers all around the world. Uh, with the new directory, uh, we're rolling out support for 101 new families in 10 non-Latin scripts, which means that Google Fonts now supports 135 languages across 13 scripts. We're really proud of that. Um, some interesting things uh, you know, to observe around non-Latin usage by expanding language coverage and broadening styles like uh, by fonts like Playfair Display, uh, we've increased usage significantly. And we've seen similar jumps in some of our other families as well. So we know that users uh, know a great font when they see one, and, and the numbers really prove it. So this is just the beginning. In the coming year, uh, we have plans to review our whole catalog and spend some time investing where we think there's room to improve. Uh, and we also think there's a lot we could do together with this community. So if you're interested, let's chat some more. Uh, we've got a pizza party tomorrow. <laughs> uh, if you want to meet more of the team, a lot of our team is here. They're very friendly. They love type. They are type geeks. Um, and, and also, uh, Google's kindly sponsored the after party tonight. We'll all be there. So please come and have a beer with us. And thanks. <laughs>